Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinars. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Olivia Tuller, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is on September 8th with Larry Jensen. This will be a pre-recorded lecture with no Q&A section entitled German Reference and Research Tools. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation on Map Your Way to Genealogical Success. Before we begin, here is a little bit about James. James has over 40 years of experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog. He has served as a family history volunteer for 18 years and has presented at expos and conferences around the US, Canada, and Europe. He is a member of the board of directors of the Family History Guide Association and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. James is a professional photographer and has seven children, 34 grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. And if James is ready, we'll turn the time over to him. Okay, and I will share my screen. Okay, well, we'd like to welcome you all here today to map your way to genealogical success. I would uh, emphasize the fact that genealogical success is almost entirely dependent on finding the right location of an event in your ancestor's life. So you might hear that statement quite a few times. But what we're going to talk about primarily is the role that maps and uh, location play in genealogical research. So as I just noted, Mapping events in your ancestors' lives is fundamental to, uh, to your genealogical research. There is, uh, it's interesting because not too many people will understand how many people out there in the world can have their same exact name. Um, my awakening to this was uh, when I was quite young, our family visited uh, the, uh, in Washington, D.C., went to this big cemetery, and uh, at basically when we were driving into the cemetery, there was a rather large headstone that said James Tanner. Well, it obviously wasn't me, but it was a surprise to me that somebody else had my name. And I think that's something we carry along through our lives and are not really expecting. But as we get into genealogical research, we'll find out that names like James, John, William in English and other names in other languages can be tremendously common and have even thousands or millions of people with that, that name and, it's almost ex and the same exact surname. And even in the same middle names if, if they are employing middle names. So one of the ways and the only ways that we can begin to distinguish between all these different people that may have the same names is to focus not on the names and not necessarily so much on dates, but on location. So when we focus on location, we have a way of determining uh, uh, and identifying an, an individual. So when you put the three together, for example, you may have somebody with the same name, and you can obviously have a lot of people born on the same date because uh, that's the way the world works. But when you add in location, it's it's probably it's very improbable that anyone would have exactly the same name, be born on exactly the same day, in exactly the same place. And when we're talking about exactly the same place, we're talking about the place, meaning the hospital or the house or wherever. So uh, unless you had two women side by side and they both had a baby on the same day and they both named the baby the same and their family name was both the same and they both had the baby at exactly the same time, that's probably very remote. Now there is something that can happen and that is the babies can be switched at birth, but that has nothing at all to do with 
the problems of genealogical research. That just creates more problems. As we're solving the problems, that just creates more problems. Okay, well, so if we move on along here a little bit, we always have to remember the first rule of genealogy. And the first rule is when the baby was born, the mother was there, physically there. Um, this is this is kind of a, a, a type of a rule that you have to repeat constantly. And uh, many times I'll have people say to me, well, now see my my grandmother was born in um, in New York, and and her brother was born in uh, Wisconsin, and the other brother was born in California. Now today that could be possible because you could get about on an airplane and actually have that happen. But in if you give me the time frame, and they say, well, this happened in 1600s. Well, Wisconsin didn't, didn't exist as a place, and California didn't uh, exist as a place, and so forth. So basically, until you start looking at the, at the locations and the uh, physical possibility of the mother being able to be available to have a baby in that location at the time that it occurred, then that's when you begin to understand that the first rule of genealogy helps us sort out a lot of this problems that occur with same name, same place type, it's same name, same time kind of situations. Where we commonly saw a family, see a family member that's born within six months or so of another family member and even in the same place. Well, you've got to take that into consideration, the physical, uh, characteristics of the of way people were born. Of course, when we get into the modern age, there may be some differences happening. So when you examine the family tree or any family tree, uh, there are millions and millions of family trees out there online now. Make sure all the dates and places are consistent with the time frame when the events were supposed to occur. So when you start to think about the time it took to travel from one place to another, then that's that's going to be depend that's going to be determinant of how reasonable it was that these two people could be related. And one of the things that happens quite frequently in England is that uh, people here in the United States are not particularly familiar with uh, whether or not, a particular place is near or far from where from another. So you might have two counties, like say, for example, I just pulled up uh, a reference to Lancashire County. And what if I said the next person in the family was born in Middlesex County? Would you automatically know? Well, maybe you do if, you, if you're familiar with English geography and you know where those two counties are on a map you may realize that back in 1781 that that's probably not, they're probably not related. Um, very high possibility of the fact because it would be like saying one baby was born in uh, at the same time period in, in Massachusetts and another one was born in Georgia. So that's, uh, that's about the kind of distance a relative distance that it would be within the country of England, of course, which is much more uh, geographically compact than the United States. Okay, so now I'm going to give you an example. Here's Peter Sutton, born in 1781 in Billinge, Lancashire, England. And um, then we have Ann Sutton, born in 1782 in the same family as a sister. And now we have another one listed, and this is this is uh, cropping directly out of uh, some entries in the in the familysearch.org family tree uh, that I found and using it as an example. The, the next one's born in 1784, and they're born in Ashton in Makerfield, Lancashire. Now, perhaps you can tell where Lancashire is. But I would suggest probably that uh, very few people, unless they've been doing research in this exact same area, would know how far it was from Billinge to Ashton and Makerfield, and whether this is reasonable, even given the fact that there are two people born in the same year. Now, there is a possibility uh, 
in the, in a, in the, in the real world that you have twins and triplets and even that possible more than that but to have two people who are born in two different places in the same year is probably not reasonable so one of these has to be wrong one of them has to be not correct now the fact that all of the other siblings in this family are are uh, born in the same place is pretty persuasive that the one that's wrong is thomas sutton now it might help you to know that in this area in billings there's actually a town named sutton and this is a very very common name in this particular area of england and so when you get something like this, it's very possible that someone has just simply uh, inadvertently or mistakenly added this person in without checking to see that the dates are, are not the same. Now, what happens if it's, it's physically possible, for example, if Mary Sutton was born at, uh, in January and Thomas Sutton was born in December of the same year, that's possible. It may not be much good for for what the, the mother's experience is with the situation, but that is possible. So why don't we look and see if these uh, two children were born that they were born in the same year uh, in two different look, but why they were and how that could possibly have happened. So we're going to look kind of here at Thomas Sutton, and we'll check the distance from Billinge to uh, Ashton in Makerfield. And we'll just put that information into uh, Google Maps and let it see what that says. So now we're going to uh, put in Billinge, and there it is. And then we'll add in Ashton and Makerfield and see how far it is. It's only four miles away. So how do we conclude? We can't just necessarily make any kind of a real conclusion from that because it is very possible that those two, the two uh, people in that family were born given the fact that, that the distances between the two places are only four miles away. So this is going to be a kind of situation which is the exception, not the exception to the rule, but, but it creates a more uh, a specific need to do more research. But now we have that. In other words, we haven't ruled it out all of a sudden because they live too far apart and that it was not physically possible for the mother to have traveled. But here it's the, the mother could uh, essentially have walked that distance. And there may have been a reason why that, that, uh, that occurred. So knowing these places, however, raises the, uh, what I would call the threshold interest, the threshold concern of whether or not these two people are in fact part of the same family or two different families. So why were the two children born in the same year in two different towns and the rest of the children born back in the first town? So why was everybody born in Billinge and only one child, even though they were born or said to be born in the same year? Now, one of the complicating factors that you have to take into consideration when you're doing English research is that we really don't have birth dates. There's, there's not, and back in 1700, it's very unusual to find an actual birth date. The dates that we're actually going by, or particularly the year of birth, is dependent, is uh, because of it's the christening date, the baptismal date of the child. And so is it possible that two children were baptized in the same year? The answer is absolutely. That's, that's not even unusual. So even though we have this underlying rule that, that, that would encourage us to ch check the geography, the distance, we also have to know the circumstances and the time period involved and what it is that we're looking at when we see a date that appears to be too close together for, uh, for some kind of practical reality of how these two, two children were born. It is very, very possible that these two children were not born in the same year and they were merely christened in the same year. And that for whatever reason, 
one of them was christened in Ashton and Makerfield and the other in Billinge. So that's uh, maybe the priest was unavailable at the time this, the child was born and they had to travel across uh, a few miles away to find the priest on another date. So unless you happen to know the distance between all the places mentioned in your family tree, you need to map them each time you work on a particular family. And fortunately, we have tools that make that mapping uh, relatively easy and, um, and quick because you can just put the places into um, uh, Google Maps and have it tell you exactly where there are. You can use the other mapping. There are other mapping programs, but uh, it is just it's known that Google Maps is more comprehensive than any of the other uh, products out out there. So, what you happen to when you, you that gives you a reality check. It tells you that the family, uh, the places mentioned in the family, are consistent with the distances that could have been traveled at the time that the events occurred. And once you have that reality check, then, then as I've just illustrated, there are other concerns. There's things that you still may have to answer, even if it turns out that the two places are not inconsistent to the extent that they rule each other out simply by the fact that, they, that people could not travel that far in that time period. So uh, how does that work? How far can you travel at certain time periods? And, and there are references out there. This one is an old one. It's called the Atlas of Historical Geography in the United States. It was published back in 1932. Now, the nice thing about older genealogical reference materials, such as this geography of the United States, is the geography really hasn't changed. Um, some political boundaries may have changed, uh, but the way the world's put together doesn't change all that fast. And old books, even the old geography books, are very useful because they can help us to focus in on different time periods and see how that worked. And so on this map, there's a series of map. This book, by the way, is, is available on uh, the website called archive.org. That's A-R-C-H-I-V-E dot O-R-G, archive.org, or the Internet Archive as are about 35 million other books um, that are valuable. So these are, this is a series of maps that's been kind of floating around the internet for, for quite a few years uh, because it's uh, back in 1932 and uh, is part of the public domain. And it shows you in different years, starting back there in 1890, excuse me, in 1800, uh, the uh, distance, or 1774, the distance between uh, the main strange routes and the main post roads, roads and uh, how the road system developed in different parts. And then the railroads, initial railroads in the United States and navigable rivers. This is all the ways that people could travel, uh, assuming they had access to these various things. So you can see here that in 1800, um, it's um, quite a bit different. Let me pull that up and close so you can get to see that a little better. Uh, if you started out in New York, uh, the little lines are like kind of topographical lines, but they're, they're timelines and they tell you the average time that it took to, um, to travel from a distance. This is, this is kind of assuming optimal conditions and optimal travel ability. So uh, we're not talking about somebody starting out on foot. Uh, we're talking about using the, the, the best method of travel that was available in, in those days. And some of that travel had to do with, with taking a boat out of New York uh, or traveling on rivers or traveling uh, on the existing roads that were available. But as time goes, you can see that there was uh, there's a considerable amount of difference between the time it takes to get from uh, New York to uh, other parts of the country that today would be uh, maybe just a long day of driving in a car. So our, our conception of how all this worked has to be adjust, adjusted to the conditions at the time. 
Um, one of the examples I, uh, that comes to mind is uh, during the Constitutional Convention, which was being held in of the United States, which was being held in um, Annapolis, Maryland, at the existing state uh, capital of the uh, United States, which uh, the State House in Annapolis was for a time the Capitol building, uh, where this the center of government. That during that time, Thomas Jefferson, was, who was uh, obviously a major pl uh, participant in that Constitutional Convention, uh, had to come from his home in Virginia, which is um, maybe a couple of hours away, three or four hours away from Annapolis, if you were to get in a car. During that time period, it was extremely wet and the roads were completely muddied up and it took Jefferson over two weeks to travel from his home to Annapolis to attend the, con the conference. So depending on conditions, uh, this could be, it could be tremendously expand the time. Now, the question that comes up is whether or not uh, there's kind of a rule of thumb that's been around for a long time in genealogy. And that is that um, a person who was born in, uh, in the time period, and we're talking about early 1800s and before, before the, the Industrial Revolution, uh, the official date for the beginning of the Industrial Revolution is with the building of the first railroads in England, and that occurred in, in about 1850, around 18, excuse me, 1830. And uh, so there's some dates there in the 1800s that give us kind of milestones. And uh, the idea was that uh, that's been around for a very long time is that people were born married and died within six miles of their birth date place. Well, my heritage uh, decided to test that and employed a tremendously large amount of data. All the information in the, in the family search family tree, all the information in all of the family trees on my heritage plus all of the sources that were available from both those places and put all that information into a massive um, computer program and then ask some questions of the data. And they published this in the journal Science back in 2018. And you can uh, read the abstract. And there's a couple of places online where the, the article is available. Um, so there's that's available here. You can see the link to it on the bottom of the page there. So here's the summary that before 1750, most Americans found a spouse within six miles of their birthplace. So basically con, uh, confirming that this six mile uh, rough estimate ha had some basis. And by 1950, that a distance had stretched to about 60 miles. Um, which is interesting. And from my own personal perspective, it's interesting because my wife and I were born in the same hospital four months apart. So uh, we were like zero miles from being born about from the place where uh, we uh, where we were born from when we ought to, when we got married. And uh, before 1850, Marrying in the family was common. And this is an interesting one that the average fourth cousins married each other compared to seventh cousins today. So uh, the other kind of general rule is that when you get into small uh, areas such as parishes in England or counties in the United States in, in America, that um, it's, it's very possible over time that nearly everybody becomes interrelated, that, that if you go back just four generations back or five generations back, everyone uh, is pretty well related to each other. And that, it, that varies when there's been immigration and where there's been migration and, and, and people have moved from one part of the world to another and then they get all mixed up again. But uh, generally speaking, this is this, these are rules that uh, you have to keep in mind when you're trying to establish the reality of what's available 
to, uh, to what you're seeing in a family tree, for example. And uh, if they, between 1800 and 1850, then they traveled quite a distance. They went almost 12 miles on the average, but they were even more likely to marry a fourth cousin or closer. So if you think about interactions among people and the ability they had to meet someone and get married, uh, whatever the culture, that, uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, as long as you understand this, it makes doing your research uh, both easier and harder. It makes it easier uh, conceptually to understand what's going on, but it makes it harder because you start to get people who marry their cousins and their in-laws are all married and it makes things a little more complicated. Okay, so uh, the fact is today that every square inch of the world's surface has been mapped. It's uh, the satellite views of the, of the world are complete. There is no part of the world where there isn't uh, a satellite view showing what, what the existing land, how the existing land is, is um, made up, what, what's there. So uh, there aren't any blank place, places on the maps. There's no uh, uh, unknown world part of the, of, the, of the world map. Now, if you're walking on the surface of the earth, you may run into things that are a little bit unusual, but uh, given, the, given a, a, a constant uh, internet access, you would always have a, a map of where you were. Uh, available on on some device, whether it was a, a smartphone or a uh, satellite phone of some kind, and or a pre-downloaded map that showed you all the area of where you were. So we don't really have any particular controversy now. Where does the controversy come? Well, the controversy in the in location comes with the changes in uh, the places and the names of those places and, and the political, social, cultural uh, boundaries that have been created so that uh, we have some examples uh, of that is that people who commonly come uh, because of US census records primarily and the way they've characterized uh, the geography of the world is that you will find people who come and say, well, my ancestor was born in Germany in 1864 and the answer is, well, where was he really born? Because there was no real Germany in 1864. And so which country or which division, political subdivision out there that would have kept the records, uh, where was that person born? So we can use the information that we do have and our historical information and the historical maps to determine exactly where a person was born, which boils down to determining which parish or village or town or farm or house that they were built, that they were born in or events occurred in. Okay, so we're gonna look here at um, uh, what the issue is in genealogical research is identifying that place of an event that occurred in an ancestor's life. I've been doing a, a long string of of immigration cons consultations for the, the Salt Lake Family History Library. And uh, we've done, I've done hundreds of them and almost 100% of all of these uh, hundreds of consultations that have been scheduled dealt with um, the place the immigrant came from. Identifying the immigrant by figuring out where exactly they came from in any country out there in the world. And, it, and we've looked at everything from, I've looked at everything from uh, Switzerland to Australia to uh, all the way around the world. Predominantly I've been doing uh, in uh, Latin America. And so the places I'm, that are trying to be identified are uh, places in uh, Argentina and Uruguay and uh, and the other surrounding Chile and Peru and all the other places around there. And a fair number in, in, in Spain and in Italy and uh, in Germany and in uh, Canada 
and Mexico and other places. So this is kind of the, the core issue that everybody seems to bump up against as you go back in time, because eventually you're going to find that someone was born someplace else. And then their question always arises that even though there may be an existing place with an existing person in a family tree, do we actually have that verified? And the question then arises is, do you have a child parent relationship established by a historically valid document and source? Okay, so once you know the plates, then you can start to find the documents. And once you find the document, you need one that establishes a parent-child relationship. It doesn't help you if you find a uh, land and property record for the father or the, the name of the father and another record for the son, unless it actually shows that connection between the two. So this is not uh, that parent-child relationship. So here's my example. This is James Pryor and he's born in, uh, uh, before 1735 and doesn't have a place. He has a death in 1828, and uh, it's in England. And uh, the question is, who is this person? And, and how do we know that this person is related? And, uh, and, and this comes from my going back in the family search family tree and picking an example. So each person needs to be identified by a specific place and a parent-child relationship. So unless you have that, you have reached the end of your line. So here's the challenge. If you start clicking back on any line in your, um, in your family tree, uh, it doesn't matter where it is, whether it's on a, a big website, on your desk program, desktop program, or wherever it is, but as you go back on a line and you look at the sources that have been attached supporting the event, the, the, the occurrences, the events in the people's lives, the, the main question you have for each individual that you click through, including each member of the family and all the children and all the grandchildren and great-grandchildren and all the descendancy is, is there a document that shows that this child was the son or daughter of this parent, period. And did that happen in a specific place? Okay, so within the last few days, I have, uh, I went out on one of my family lines and I found uh, a family in New England uh, that came from England. And then I went back and it showed the, the family in England, the next line back. And in that family, every single child, there were six or eight children, were born as indicated by their entries in family search in a different county back in the 1700s in England. And the answer to that was none of these people are related. And we don't even know if we have the right parents because their child, the supposed child who was my direct line ancestor, was not born in the same county as the parents even, or where they were married. And so this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, mixed salad kind of uh, a family where there's just nobody born in the same specific place is not reasonable. And it's probably not correct. Not just probable, but undoubtedly not correct. Okay, so to do this, and this helps us to avoid the, the same name, same person trap because too many times it, it all fits. And one of the examples that I uh, just ran into in the last few days was a family I was researching where the husband and the wife had a, a, were, were in Chicago. This was Chicago, Illinois, and it was during the 18, uh, the, the, um, uh, eight, this, 1900s because I was starting with the 1950 census. And they, this family then, uh, I traced it back to the 1940 census. And then I found them in the 1930 census, apparently the husband and wife, same name, husband, the name, wife, same name. And uh, another coincidence in that was that the, the original one in 1950 had a niece staying with them whose surname was Smith, which I automatically began to think was 
uh, the name, the wife's maiden name. So as I went back, I found the same name people. If it was Charles Butler and Gertrude um, Butler, uh, staying with the Smiths in the 1930 census. So all of a sudden, I thought, well, yeah, we're back in the 1930 census. More research because they were in two different places. More research, I kept saying, well, I don't believe this is correct for some reason. And more research indicated that that was not the case. They were not related, even though they lived very close to each other. So you can, uh, but uh, you really need to start with the location and then examine all the other circumstances that might occur. As it turned out, the reason why there was a person staying with them that happened to have the same surname as this other couple with the same names was because the husband's mother's mother was a Smith. And so that Smith name came up uh, even in this other family. So this is the kind of thing that, that by the way, takes uh, a little bit of sweat and a little bit of concentration to get through because of the because what seems to be the easy explanation, especially from what appears to be just right there on census records, may not be the case. So here's here's kind of an inter, inter uh, we'll look at that prior name that I just looked up a while back. And this is uh, find my past. And this is their um, uh, search all the records. This is a uh, a way of searching everything, all of the indexed records on Find My Past. And by the way, all the records on Find My Past are indexed. And so this is searching millions and millions of records, uh, billions of records. And uh, basically, if you do a search like this, it's all open. You'll see it's everything in the world. And all I'm really asking about that last name is its frequency. How many different people in, the, in all those records have the name prior. And if you go drop down to the bottom of the screen, you'll see that the number comes up of 61, 66, 661,650 records with prior as um, a surname. Um, given that I've done this kind of search over and over and over again, in order to get a concept of the frequency of a name, I've seen where I put in a name and the number of records that, that come up, uh, like there's only 30 records in all the billions of records on Find My Past, there's only 30 records that have that particular name. So I can be assured that, that anybody with that name is probably rela related. But here, there's kind of a margin of difference. Now, what's the other end of the spectrum? Well, if we go to the other end of the spectrum, um, we can see what happens with um, a, a name. If I add in James Pryor and I put in a date, then I can see the number drop. In this case, there are 13,354 people named James Pryor in their records in 1828. So this gives me a pretty good idea that they're from, and if you go down the list of places for these records, they're in Cornwall and Cambridgeshire and London and, and uh, uh, all the way down, they're mostly, in, they're Gloucestershire and Staffordshire and uh, Wiltshire and Chichester, Chichester and uh, it's, I mean, you the chances of you actually finding the right James prior without knowing his the exact location of an event in his life is pretty pretty uh, remote. It's just not going to happen. So without a location in that case, it's like sitting in the boat in the middle of a large lake and trying to hit a, a specific fish with a rifle, not with trying to catch a fish, but trying to shoot a fish. And then the answer is, even if you were to hit a fish with the rifle, did you get the right fish? And without that uh, ability to focus in on the location of an event, along with the date and along with the name, then you are not going to be able to find the right people. Your, your chances of doing that in, with any given name uh, are extremely, extremely remote. 
And I've had people come to me and say, well, particularly in the Tanner line, they've come to me and said, well, I know that this is the right William Tanner, because we looked at all the William Tanners in England at that time, and this is the only one that makes reason that this person could have been the person. And the answer is, without a parent-child relationship, without a document that actually shows that this person in the United, in America, was the, the child of that it, person in England, there's no way in the world that doing that kind of an activity can produce the right name. Okay, so here's, here's one way to start. That is to spend some time looking at maps of where your ancestors lived. Become familiar with these areas. Begin to look at the roads. And the good thing about it is with uh, Google Street View, you can zoom in and look at the towns. Uh, the only place in Europe that you can't reasonably drive almost all over place in Europe is in Germany, and they have their own street maps and their own views, but uh, it's not as easy to use as Google. They're the only ones that help that don't don't cooperate with Google. But basically, you're you're looking at uh, right here at the whole at the community, and it. And if you know a little bit of the history and you start to learn a little more about specifically, for example, the architecture of the houses, then you would notice that there's the houses on the right side of the screen uh, have two chimneys, one at each end of the house, and that um, they're built in this box, st box style, just a, a in uh, New England and sometimes in some places it's called a cracker box but basically this box style here and that's a very very old these houses are probably uh, at least into the early 1800s or into the 1700s and maybe even a little bit older in, in some cases now they've been rebuilt and upgraded but the basic form of the two chimneys was the only way they had to keep those houses moderately warm in the, in the British climate. So basically when you drive around the streets, you can tell, is this a big town? Is it a little town? Uh, what's the chances that my people uh, had relatives here? And uh, what's the chances that everybody in the town is related or that it's a big city and uh, there may be neighborhoods that are related, but not everybody. So one good practice is to take the place that one of some of your ancestors came from and um, basically get uh, look into Wikipedia. And over on the right hand side, you'll see that it uh, tells you that it's in the district of Huntingdonshire in the Shire County, that's the actual county today is Cambridgeshire. And then region is East countries, England and the sovereign states United Kingdom. And then it's a lot of other things. And then there's actually a website for the town and, and links. And then there's a history of the town that tells you uh, how long it's been around and what you can expect uh, historically. And you also might want to know that it was historically in Huntingdonshire and uh, it is still in the district of Huntingdonshire in Cambridgeshire, but uh, that the counties were all changed around in the, in the 1970s. And so uh, you need to be aware that the, the maps aren't going to be correct if they say, if you say that's in Cambridgeshire, it might not be also in Huntingdonshire. So there's things like that that you need to learn about. So here's the explanation um, blown up. So you can see all the detail and all the links that are here about this particular town. So there's so many things here that, uh, that are helpful. For example, almost everything here tells you how, um, uh, where additional records might be located and where the, uh, how to explain where the people were uh, when they say they were from this area, if they were really just from the same, the same little market town. So this is, uh, this is helpful information always. And it's kind of a routine. Uh, that I do, I put it on the map 
and then I look it up in uh, look up the places in Wikipedia to get an idea of which jurisdictions, which of the which area I needed to go to to get uh, records for this particular place. So understanding that all genealogically valuable records were created at a specific place and time. Um, so whatever record it was, somebody sat down and created that record. They either wrote it out longhand or filled in a form or typed it on a typewriter or put it into a computer. But whatever they did, this, that record was created uh, at a specific place and time. Now, what happens from there is that records move, and that's another general rule of genealogy. But the fact that records move, it makes it interesting for genealogists because we have to track down where the original records may be kept. One good way to get an idea of the kinds of records that might be available and exactly what places they pertain to is to go to Family Search and use the catalog, not necessarily as a finding aid, but as an educational aid that tells you exactly how much, uh, tells you where the place is and what part it is. So here on this, it's telling you that England, Huntingdonshire, and then they have um, Ramsey as a part of Huntingdonshire. So here's the example. This is this is the the kind of the the ultimate example, and that is that a person is buried in a specific spot, and that as a genealogist, it's our job to find the spot. And uh, if we do find the spot, then we're going to find a lot of records associated with that spot. And as we go back in time, it's going to be harder to find the spot, and it's going to be harder to find the records until you get back to the point where the records are in a language you can't read or they are no longer available. So one of the ways we could we can get around that is to use a program called Billion Graves. Now, a lot of us are familiar with another program that's called Find a Grave. And Billion Graves came out as a competitor with Find a Grave and immediately implemented uh, using GPS coordinates to, uh, to locate uh, the cemeteries and also all the graves within the cemeteries. So using a billion graves program, you can find, if you find a, a, a grave marker, a record of a grave marker, it'll have the, geogra the, the geo geographic location of that marker exactly. And you can actually use the program to walk to the actual grave site, at least the one that was marked by the person who registered that grave. So that gives you a great advantage to finding the exact website, that, that exact location, which then generates records or possible records. Maybe they're lost, maybe they're not so available, maybe you don't know what to ask for, but there are a lot of things that can happen once you know that. And what about name changes? Well, here's an example of a, of a website uh, called Kartmeister. And Kartmeister has taken a list of names, uh, of place names in Europe and translated them from, and made them uh, explain the name changes for, from an English and German and in Polish. And then also, um, Lithuanian and German and English and some other thing, and Latin. So there's a lots of different names in here showing you this correspondence. And uh, sometimes you can do a Google search and come up with this information, but it's nice to know that there's a web that website out there that can help you find that. And there's uh, one area, uh, we still talk a lot of, about records and we say, well, not all records have been digitized. Well, that's a vast understatement. There's still a monumental amount of records to be digitized. Uh, even in just one archive, there's more records than, than have been digitized. But what we have for maps is that there are so many maps digitized and so much of the world has been mapped, like I said, all of it, that maps basically are totally available online. Um, I 
have yet in many years found a necessity to go any place but online to look for some particular place on the face of the earth. There are huge databases like the Board on Geographic Names from the United States that have been spending over 100 years accumulating every geographic location on the face of the earth. So these are uh, there are these huge databases out there of all the names and all the places and maps that show you where they all are. So here's the basic tools. The basic tools are Wikipedia and a program, I would say Google Maps. Um, they are they definitely have driven to and been to more places than than anyone else can possibly has can possibly catch up with in this day and age. So these are the two basic tools. And the next basic tool is maybe surprising, and that's the Family Search Research Wiki. Because what it has done is taken every country in the world and organized, exhaustively organized, all of the uh, available genealogical records. Now, they're not complete. It's not exhaustive. It's not every single record that ever lived, but it is a uh, tremendous aid in getting you into the geographic areas of the of uh, and the records that might be available for there. Everything is organized geographically in genealogy, so it's helpful to know the geography. So it's the the, the key words again are location, location, and location, meaning when you have the location available and you have the uh, adi some additional information, then you have a chance to find additional records. As long as you have something vague like New York or London or Minnesota or England or Ireland or Germany, you, you cannot, you cannot find the records. It, it, it's, there's just no mechanism that will give you the record, the correct records. And, and once you have a location, even if it's location where a child was born or a location where an event occurred in the person's life that gives you that specific location, you are then facilitated in finding additional records. Okay, well, thank you so much for watching. And uh, are there any questions? I don't see any right now. I might mention that um, I can't, uh, these kind of routinely, uh, I make a copy of the slides here and we put that into uh, the BYU Family History Library archive that's on the BYU Family History Library website. So you can go look through this, but you can also see, as was already said, that these will be posted to the BYU Family History Library uh, YouTube channel and also appear in the list on the BYU Family History Library website. So all this information is, is available in the future. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is on Thursday, September 8th with Larry Jensen. This will be a pre-recorded lecture, German Reference and Research Tools. A recording of this webinar will be made available next week. You can view that on our YouTube channel or our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at FHL underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.